Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Chad Kalick, and welcome back to the Inner Crowded Room podcast for episode number 49, which is going to be a Q&A podcast because we've once again made our way through 10 more episodes in which every 10 episodes we'll do a Q&A to make sure that I am answering your questions and fostering further conversation about the podcast. So let's just jump right into it. The first question is actually not a question, it's a comment made by two people. And this is in response to the Robert Johnson episode number 48, in which Paula says, you definitely need to write a book. And Mark also says, You have been put in places and situations in your life that 90% of this world will never experience. It's definitely time to write a book. Well, thank you both for that. What I can tell you is that I have been writing a book for a long time. And I recently stumbled upon an idea that I got really excited about because I don't want to just release a garden variety book. I'm more interested in a series of books. And an idea just kind of came across my radar that made me feel like it's something that we can probably do sooner than later. So stay tuned for more info about that. But I definitely enjoy writing. And what I like about it the most is you can really get into the the detail. you know. And there's a lot of detail with a lot of these stories that I think is very important and I just don't want to leave anything out and uh, I think you guys will enjoy the book. What I can tell you is that what I've written to date is excessively honest. It is unforgiving. There's more truth in this book than probably any book I think you would ever read regardless of who that upsets or bothers and a lot of times uh, I'm the one that's bothered by it (laughs) but I just think that there's no reason to write a book about life experiences unless you're going to be 100% honest and to Mark in response to your comment about I've been in situations that 90% of this world would never experience Um, I hope that's not true. I hope people get to get out there and live uh, their dreams. What I can tell you is that was an active choice to say yes from a young age. I mean, to say yes to experience. And that comes from my father. My father was an engineer in the Air Force. And, and, you know, up to the age of 10, I would only see him a couple times a year because he was stationed in Guam in Germany, in Switzerland, in England, in Italy. And I used to just think, that is so freaking cool. I mean, of course I missed him and I wanted him around, but he was like this superhero to me. As a child, it was like the United States government (laughs) sends my dad to all these places to build planes. I was just like, it was just the coolest thing to me. And he signed up for that, you know, he, uh, He chose to do it. So I remember thinking at a young age that in this lifetime, I will value memories and experience above anything else. Above anything material, I want to live. So it was just about saying yes. And that's what happened in the Robert Johnson episode. What I'm referencing is just saying yes. Just we had no plans to go down to visit my friends. We just made them in a day and said yes and went. We just showed up. And by following that kind of protocol for life, you know, I ended up living this experience. And um, you know, I'd like to believe that I still do that today. I'm, I might be slowing down a little bit, but I'm still inclined to say yes most of the time when it comes to experiences which I hope others do as well, because we only get one shot, right? We got one life. That's it. Everything there is to experience in this world, I want to experience. And whether it 
is good for me or hurts me. You know, you just never know, you know, who you are until you've had experiences. And those things uh, will shape who you are, right? It'll tell you what you like, what you don't like, what you're into, what you're not. And uh, I think that's probably the most exciting thing about just saying yes to opportunity is learning about yourself. So, all right, moving on. Elizabeth from Calgary asks, will you ever do a podcast about your relationship with Ryan Buell? I noticed that you don't answer questions about him when asked in the comments. Uh, when it comes to doing a podcast about my experiences with Ryan, I think the time will come where that's appropriate. You know, uh, there's a lot going on in my life. I don't think about Ryan Buell every day. I mean, it, it's, you know, we have a lot that we're doing and that we're focusing on. And it's been almost a decade since I worked with Ryan. So the second, you know, I start talking about a lot of the stuff that went on, then, you know, he will start talking about it. And then pretty soon that becomes like the thing that people want to discuss and hear about. And it's just, uh, it's not that important of a thing in my world right now. That's just being straight honest. Um, as I've said before, I am the last person in the world that will condemn somebody for drug addiction. I would love to believe that there is a road back for everybody. I hope that he finds a way to just make things right. And that's up to him, you know, uh, there's a lot of stories I have with Ryan that are wonderful stories. I mean, Ryan was truthfully somebody that I considered a brother, but things also got very, very dark and it's kind of weird because a lot of the, the darkest stuff that people want to talk about, I don't think they remember or realize that I wasn't around for any of it. Um, you know, Ryan's drug addiction overtook him towards the end of the final season of Paranormal State, in which I had made the decision to leave Paranormal State and focus on the ghost prophecies. And Ryan chose uh, to leave Paranormal State, in my opinion, because he wasn't able to carry on, you know, working on the show and having that addiction. But all the, the really super, really dark, dark stuff... Uh, such as, you know, Ryan getting arrested and, you know, biting some dude's finger, or Ryan stealing cars, or, you know, the the Canadian tour. Uh, you know, I, I get asked all the time about the conversations with the Dead tour. Uh, I turned it down. I was never a part of it. I think I'm the only cast member that was asked to be a part of it that did turn it down. Um I don't know anything about it, I, so I can't really speak about it, you know? It's the same thing with, uh, he had another event or something go wildly wrong in San Francisco or something like that, and, um, you know, the last event that I was scheduled to do with Ryan was an AGH event in Iowa in which he didn't show up, in which I was very honest with everybody why he didn't show up, and, uh, you know, the last time that I truthfully hung out with Ryan for a long period of time was honestly like, God, I'm trying to think, probably 2012 or 13. And that's, you know, when he was sharing with Laura that he had cancer. You know, which I later heard that that wasn't the case. So... There's just, there's so much that he and I need to talk about before I would talk, you know, with the public about it. But before that could even happen, he's just got to do his thing. He's got to get right, you know, and, and I'm saying that. There's no part of me that needs Ryan to knock on my door so I could be whole again or anything like that. I mean, for those people that want to see me like attack Ryan or you know, go off and scream and do all this stuff. We moved on. 
and I can truthfully say this, Ryan needs to focus on Ryan. And I, and I say that you know, with all the positivity that I can say it with. I really mean that. Ryan just needs to focus on Ryan. And when the time comes for me to do a podcast about my relationship with him, um, I'll do that. And I don't know when that'll be. That could be next week. It could be five years from now. Um, I hope that I hope that answers your question. I hope that makes sense to everybody. So, moving on. Carla from Oklahoma City says, "Thank you for being so honest about your marriage and your past mistakes." I think I speak for a lot of us when I say that your honesty is why I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time. Oh, when I say that your honesty is why I'm a loyal listener. Uh, she says, my question is, if you can point out one aspect of your and Laura's relationship that has kept you together for so long, what would it be? Um, what would it be? Honestly, her. She's... <sighs> Laura is an angel. I mean, and I know, you know, people say that, and it's just endearing to say, but like, the one amazing thing about Laura is she has never tried to change me. She has always been very aware of who I am, very aware of what my struggles are, what my flaws are, and she's never been a line in the sand ultimatum girl. She's always been willing to try to understand and try to take the high road. And uh, it's inspiring to me. I mean, it really is. <clears throat> you know, I've said this a million times to Laura. I said, you know, the best thing about marrying you is uh, you were better than me. And I knew it. And she's just amazing. I mean, yeah, I, I, there are no words, guys. I mean, I mean, of course she's human like anybody else. And we have our like flaws and our fights. Stuff, but, but like, really, like what's kept us together for this long is her ability to understand and be patient and her ability to show me what it means to really love somebody, to really, really love somebody. And love is defined in the darkest of hours, man, in your worst moments, when things have gone, you know, from bad to horrific. What is your relationship like then? Everybody can party. Everybody can celebrate. Everybody can enjoy good times. But when it's bad, you know, when it's really, really bad, how do you operate? And Laura's always been somebody that demonstrated that she was above my mistakes. And uh, I learned from her, you know. I learned from her. I learned to be a better person from her. And she just always exercised so much understanding. It made me want to exercise understanding towards her. So when she would mess up, I would be like, well, you know, how upset can I get? You know, when I've had a thousand second chances, you know. And as far as the story that I told in the Robert Johnson episode, what I loved about that is... I don't believe that sex should be a reason that you're with somebody, nor should it be a reason why you break up with somebody. And I think early on, because we were able to work through a lot of my mistakes, I realized that our relationship was built on something really special which is that friendship, that genuine love, that partnership in the world. Somebody who says, in this world, I got your back. 
No matter what happens, I got your motherfucking back. And that makes sharing the good times all the more special. So I would love to take, you know, all kinds of credit for, you know, why we've been together this long. Um, but my honest opinion is, because uh, Laura's amazing and she's really taught me how to, uh, how to love, how to be patient, how to care, how to be kind, how to be understanding. Yeah, she's awesome, guys. <laughs> so I could tell you she's awesome. So, all right, moving on. Kath from Middlemount, Queensland, Australia, says you mentioned a while ago that you have some new in a crowded room music coming out. Any updates? Also, what is the name of the song you use in the podcast? The name of that song is Roadless Travel. Um, you can get it on iTunes. I do have new music. Very soon, I'm going to be releasing like the equivalent of a box set, uh, 20 to 25 songs, uh, possibly even 30. That includes studio recordings dating all the way back to 2004, um, all the way up to 2015. Uh, original material covers. Uh, and there's also live kind of B-sides, tracks that I, you know... Uh, wrote but never polished and then also a lot of live acoustic covers i've been wanting to do this for a long time to release just a massive body of work that scans like you know a couple decades and that's going to happen in the next i would say month probably so if you're interested in my music um, stay tuned a bunch of it is coming so i appreciate uh, the question, Kath. Thank you. Um, okay, moving on. Liam Muster from Berg, Bergen, Norway. Liam Muster from Bergen, Norway asks, If I would ever consider doing a podcast on ocean, lake, or river-based cryptids, such as the Loch Ness Monster. Liam, by the way, great name. Liam Muster from Bergen, Norway. It's uh, awesome to know that the Inner Crowded Room podcast has Norway represented Liam. Uh, Liam Muster. God, it's a great name. Um, sure, absolutely. I'm massively into ocean-based cryptids. Uh, we don't know anything about the ocean. I mean, less than 5% of the world's oceans are mapped. We have no idea. Uh, I recently watched this documentary about two specific locations that that scientists swore that life would not exist. And one of them was at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. And when James Cameron went down there, they discovered something like 3,000 new species. And it was all these fish that, like, glowed, like they would generate their own light. They were, I, I forget the actual scientific name for it, but it was just mind-blowing. There were all these crazy, crazy, crazy looking fish down there and sharks. And uh, there's a really weird story. The first time that it was ever attempted to go down to the bottom of Marianas Trench, these scientists stopped about three quarters of the way there and freaked out because their radar equipment started picking up massive massive fish, like something huge that went right by them. And they panicked and said, get me the fuck out of here. And that's a true story. So definitely go watch the documentary on that. It's pretty hilarious. Um, and the other place, of course, is below the ice in Antarctica. Uh, again, scientists swore that nothing could live down there. There's not enough light. There's not enough oxygen. And... Once they drilled through like almost two miles of ice and punched through to this underground lake, yep, as you can imagine, teeming, teeming with life. Again, thousands, thousands of new species discovered. We just don't know anything about our oceans, and I don't think it would be hard at all to believe 
That's something like Megalodon is real. And beyond that, even bigger sharks or bigger whales or uh, bigger everything. You know, for a long time, they thought that the giant squid was mythical. And this had been written about since Christopher Columbus and Ponce de Leon. Everybody thought, oh, well, it's legend and lore. They're just writing legend and lore. No, they weren't. Uh, a Japanese net fishing vessel captured the world's first massive giant squid, and it was exactly as it was written about, uh, you know, thousands of years ago, where this thing was just huge. It was just like a squid, but just gigantic. So I think there's all kinds of crazy stuff in the ocean. It's the one place where prehistoric animals had a higher likelihood of living. So yeah, I think it's definitely possible. Do I think specifically that the Loch Ness Monster exists? I don't know. Verdict's definitely out on that one. Uh, I could see how maybe somebody just saw something big in the Loch, you know? Um, but the same creature uh, in the Loch swimming around, I don't know. I don't know. There's been so many fakes. So many fakes of the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, but regardless, the idea of a large, unknown, either prehistoric animal or just an unknown cryptid coming from the ocean, to me, seems like a 100% guarantee. All it would take is time and effort to actually map the world's bodies of water. And if we do that, I mean, we're going to find all kinds of stuff that we didn't think was real. <laughs> That's my opinion. Okay, next question. Melissa from Long Beach, California says, Congrats on your weight loss. How long did it take you to lose the weight? And how are you losing it? And do you have any sort of meal planner working with you? Um, well, thank you, Melissa. I've lost 55 pounds. It's taken me about a year. How am I losing it? Through a never give up attitude, basically. Um, I do have a meal plan, but not a meal planner. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, when I wake up, I'll try to eat like an egg or two and like a piece of bacon. Uh, just something high protein in the morning. Um, that's usually around 5 a.m., Around 11 a.m. or so, I'll have some kind of snack, like grapes, some kind of fruit snack. Uh, by the way, I'm just drinking water the whole time, just tons of water, as much water as I could get in my body in a day I drink. Uh, then around 3 to 4 o'clock, I'll have what I call as a meal, but it's actually just kind of like a, a larger snack. It might be a half of a sandwich, of like a ham and cheese sandwich, um, just something a little bit bigger than a snack that, you know, carbs are okay, but I just, I, I can't do a bunch of fat and carbs together. So if I'm going to do like um, a half a sandwich, then it's just primarily going to be uh, turkey, chicken, or ham. Um, ham obviously having the most fat in it, which I recently learned uh, from a friend of mine. Uh, so then after that, I guess, larger meal around four o'clock, then I won't eat again until uh, midnight-ish if I'm really hungry. And that's usually a very small snack. That's like a uh, uh, fruit, grapes again, uh, maybe some um, cheese. I, I definitely make sure that you know, every few hours throughout the day, every three or four hours that I'm eating something to keep the metabolism going. And the only kind of big break that I take is between, um, you know, four o'clock and midnight. Now that just works for me. I'm not, you know, going to swear that'll work for everybody else, but that's what has worked for me. And I, you know, Mess up all the time. I've been on a great run now since Christmas, but I really fell off the wagon on Christmas. Packed on 10 pounds in a month from eating sugar cookies and just crap that tasted so good. Um, but I got all depressed after that, and I was like, nope, I'm getting back on the wagon. And that's the key, man. When you fail, get back on the wagon. Fail better. That's a great line I heard in the making of Game of Thrones, in which Peter Dinklage was talking about his career and how he made it. And he said, basically, I just failed better every time. 
And I thought that was such a great line, fail better. You know, and that's how I look at the diet. When I fail, get back on. And if it took me like, you know, a month to restart the diet, then the next time I fail, I'm not going to wait a month. I'm going to wait, you know, a couple days and get right back on track. And now I'm to the point where if I fail in the middle of the day, if I decide I'm going to have ice cream or something stupid in the middle of the day, I'll be back on track by dinner. Like I'm just like, I panic about it, you know? Um, but my goal is 90 pounds. So I'm going to keep going. And uh, it really does mean a lot to me that you notice that, point that out. If you want to lose weight, I can tell you this. If I can do it, anybody can. So I believe in you. Just get a mean on. Get that vision. And love yourself. That's what it's about. Love yourself, man. Love yourself enough to feel good and be the best version of yourself. And fight for it. That's it. Fight for it. Okay, moving on. And, oh, okay. So in response to the episode about Mark and Deb and Ryan Dunn, um, you know, I shared my belief that I don't think items uh, can become haunted. And uh, in response, Chelsea Upham says, but what about the doll that the Warrens have locked up? Would you say it's haunted or possessed? And I think she's referring to Annabelle, uh, which is a really funny story about Annabelle. I was in Gettysburg uh, at the same time Lorraine was, and she was setting up. They have a mobile version of the museum, and she was in this place, and her team, uh, you know, Tony and all these people were helping uh, her arrange and set up the mobile version of this stuff. And I was going through, and I was looking at all this stuff, and I was helping them move boxes and things into this room where they were staging, and I had never seen Annabelle before, so I didn't know what it was or what it looked like. And I come across this box that has this like glass in front of it. And uh, I open the box up. And I pull this little doll out. And I'm kind of looking at it like, huh, what is this? And I forget who it was. Somebody on her crew came around the corner and just freaked out. Because I was holding Annabelle in my bare hands. <laughs> so nothing happened to me. I put it back in the box, locked it back up. Uh, and uh, you know, hence my point, nothing happened to me. Uh, and I would say this too. I mean, if any of these items were really dangerous and had the potential to you know, hurt somebody or possess somebody or turn their life upside down, do you think Lorraine would let anybody potentially get hurt? No, they would not be ushering people through her house or anywhere else if these items were dangerous. Uh, I don't think they are dangerous. I think, that, uh, as I said in the episode, the human mind is dangerous. If you believe in something, then more often than not, uh, your belief can actually make uh, those things that you believe in come to be. And I think if you believe that holding Annabelle is somehow going to bring you bad luck then holding Annabelle will probably bring you bad luck. So uh, that was really my point in that episode is that the power of the mind is what's scary, not any of these items. These are items, you know. Uh, Annabelle is this Raggedy Ann looking little doll that is just, you know, uh, nothing. It's just this doll. It's cotton. It's fabric. It's It's not a person. It's not an entity. How could energy, uh, spiritual energy, uh, the actual electricity that comes off our body as human beings, how could all this stuff transfer into a doll and reside there? It doesn't make any sense to me. It's just my opinion. So, no, I don't think the doll uh, can hurt anybody. Uh, it certainly didn't hurt me whatsoever. So, Okay, we have two more. Um, a gal named Jackie Bello asks, did you know that in addition to Mark Constantino killing Debbie, he also killed Debbie's roommate? If so, do you know if Debbie was seeing this person? Jackie, I don't know if she was seeing this person or not. It certainly never said that in any of the articles. Um, that was not something that was ever revealed to me, nor would it have been. Um, if that were the case, it was obviously extremely personal. From what I understand, it was a 55-year-old man uh, that she was living with, and um, 
again, I think the articles would have said that this was her interest or affair or something. Um, I never heard that. I never read that as to why did Mark uh, shoot this man. For all we know, he could have been trying to break something up. He might have, might have been trying to protect Deb. Who knows? I don't know. All I could possibly do is speculate without any facts on what actually went down there, and I don't want to do that. So I don't know. I know what the article said, which is that it was her roommate. Um, so, again, a very sad situation. I have nothing but love for both of them. And I hope they both wound up on the, the right side of the other side. And here we go. Last question. Bob Wilson from Missouri Valley, Iowa asked if things have gotten any better with YouTube and if I've ever considered setting up a Patreon account. Uh, Bob, I wish I could say things have gotten better. They have not. They've actually gotten worse. I can pretty much count on the fact that any video that I upload is going to be at the very least hit with a limited demonetization, which is the same thing as killing it. It's taking away 95% of the ads. It's shadow banning it where it doesn't show up in searches. Uh, you know, it sucks. But on the flip side, you guys are doing an amazing job of getting the word out there because regardless of what YouTube's doing, the podcast is literally growing every single day. Every single day. And the larger and larger it gets, uh, the closer and closer we get to realizing our goal of being 100% uh, advertiser independent and with each donation that's made, we're closer to realizing my goal of being able to hire an editor that can basically crank out you know, each episode so that I can just actually record them. Because what really takes up the time and what makes everything a three, four hour process is creating all the graphics and doing all the editing and all of that stuff. And uh, you know, as soon as I can hire an editor then we'll be able to guarantee six episodes a week on a regular schedule, and I know we can get there. Um, as far as Patreon goes, you know, we initially chose PayPal because it allows you to choose whatever level of contribution or donation you want to make should you want to make one. And uh, I thought... Well, that's cool. People can just decide whether it's a buck, 50 cents or 300 bucks, whatever. Um, but what I've seen is that some people do like that, but other people do like Patreon as well. And Bob, you're not the first person to suggest that. So there will be, there absolutely will be an In a Crowded Room Patreon page that I'm going to make this weekend. So stand by when that is done and when it's up, I will... Send it out there for everybody to see. And uh, yeah. And like I said earlier, you guys are doing an amazing, amazing job. So thank you all for your support. It means the world to me. And as always, thank you for listening to the Inner Crowded Room podcast. This has been episode number 49, our third Q&A. I hope you enjoyed it. I will be back tomorrow with another episode. I will see you then, my friends. Much love and all the best.